This is how the computer sees the human brain. The intelligent machine that enabled our ancient ancestors to survive in their brutally dangerous world. The brain's rate of evolution is extremely slow, although its intelligence has stretched to its limits to produce some incredible achievements. This is how the human brain sees the computer. The computer's a calculating machine whose rate of evolution is immeasurably more rapid than the brain's. Born less than 40 years ago, the computer has already developed from a cumbersome machine driven by valves through four evolutionary generations. Valves to transistors. Transistors to microcircuits. Microcircuits to integrated circuits each generation becoming more compact and far more powerful. The 1980s have already seen a tremendous acceleration in computer development. Now an international race is on to make computers not only more powerful but highly intelligent. The Japanese have a government-sponsored crash program to develop a fifth generation of computers. They expect this fifth generation to help them solve ever more complex multifaceted social problems including but not limited to transition to an elderly society never before has a computer attempted anything so profound we seem to be witnessing the spawning of a new kind of intelligence artificial intelligence already many computers are behaving like infant prodigies what will they do when they grow up faced with such a rapid rate of evolution it would be reckless for us to make any predictions. But it would be madness not to try. Our descendant will not be the child of the loin, but the child of the brains, the thing we call the computer, uh, which does not have to pass through the birth canal and uh, does not grow by a tablespoonful of gray matter every 100,000 years, which is the case in the rapid growth of our brain, but grows a factor of 10 in power every seven years, the computer generation. There's no question but that it will match us in narrow reasoning power by 1990 and go beyond us to become the uh, great new intelligent race of the future. I can see you're really upset about this. Hey, 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 it's the big master control program everybody's been talking about. With the information I can access, I can run things 900 to 1200 times better than any human. Good morning, Dr. Chandra. This is Hal. My CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. I'm sorry, Dave. I don't have enough information. Shall we play a game, 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 game? But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces, and a god whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And we are just now where we move into the exponential phase. And I agree, artificial intelligence, but not only artificial intelligence, <coughs> but also the metaverse, new space technologies, and I could go on and on. Synthetic biology. Our life in 10 years from now will be completely different, very much affected. And who masters those technologies 
in some way will be the master of the world. So it's not even been a year since I made a video uh, in June of 2022 talking about AI and Ray Kurzweil and GPT-3 for the first time. And we've certainly come a long way in that many months in terms of the media attention that suddenly exploded at the end of 2022 and the beginning of this year. And now kind of culminating in this all-out mainstream media frenzy, everywhere from 60 Minutes to this uh, instantly famous interview with Tucker Carlson and Elon, which we'll get to in a minute. But um, yeah, now today, as I record this about an hour ago, just learned that he is no longer with Fox and, and you know, whoop de doo It's not really here nor there, but it's kind of interesting that that was one of the last things that they allowed him to do. I guess, before cutting him loose, was jump on board the Elon Musk AI is an existential threat to humanity and we need regulation, you know. And, and all this nonsense about Elon Musk being labeled a speciesist because he cares about humanity more than AI, which is hilarious. I said, well, what about, you know, we are going to make sure humanity's okay here? Um, <laughs> and, 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 um... Uh, and then he called me a speciest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did he use Did he use that term? Yes. And there were witnesses. The other, I wasn't the only one there when he called me a speciest. And so I was like, okay, that's it. Uh, I've yes, I'm a speciest. Okay, you got me. <laughs> what are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm fully a speciest. Um, busted. Yeah. So watching that whole exchange was pretty nauseating. Especially when, as I'm sure I don't have to tell many of you, this is the man who for years has been talking about <laughs> AI being such an existential threat that we actually have to merge with AI. And he has a whole company called Neuralink, whose whole goal is to create symbiosis with AI. You're a neuroscience company, and you're working to build basically an interface to the brain. Yeah. Electrode to neuron interface at a mic micro level. Okay, what is that? Like, I'm gonna have like a plug in my head that's gonna fit into mm -hmm. a hard drive? Like, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, Ch a chip and a bunch of tiny wires. This, this would be implanted surgically. And it would do what? Could you input? Could you download Jim? Mm-hmm, yes. What, what, what? <laughs> the long-term aspiration of Neuralink was, would be to achieve a symbiosis with uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and to achieve a sort of democratization of, of intelligence uh, such that it is not monopolistically held in a purely digital form by governments and, and large corporations. Basically a, an effort for man to merge with machine in yes. a healthy way. Yes. To beat machines, you basically have to merge with machines. Most likely, yes. Essentially, how do we ensure that the future constitutes the, the sum of the will of humanity? Um, and so if we have billions of people with a high bandwidth link to the AI extension of themselves, it would actually make everyone hyper smart. <laughs> <laughs> on the one hand, especially on the tales of so many psychological operations that have come and gone in the past few years and months and weeks and how it's, it's always changing, right? So next week it'll be some new existential threat that everyone's talking about. So there's definitely a level where we have to stop and go like, this is just, it has all the hallmarks of media hype designed to just push more legislation and, and government overreach, which of course isn't really about legislating these giant big tech companies, but it's about having more control over you and me. And so there's the whole contrived, scripted aspect of all, like suddenly, like why now, you know? Chat GPT suddenly gets released to the public and in many ways you can look at it as Silicon Valley kind of thrashing, <laughs> you know, thrashing about in the pool trying to stay above water because all the free money from the Fed that's been pumping into it is drying up. The entire advertising market and industry is turning inside out. And yeah, it's kind of chaos on, on every industry front, but particularly in, in Silicon Valley where, you know, already one year after the metaverse, they changed the name from Facebook to Metaverse. Zuckerberg was all in on that. 
they've just quietly abandoned their grandiose metaverse uh, uh, plans and it never really got off the ground. And so I know in a lot of ways, Silicon Valley is littered with the carcasses of these companies that can come and go and, and collapse almost overnight. And of course, ultimately only work as extensions of the the military industrial complex, the whole DARPA, you know, origins of the internet and of all this stuff. But so in some ways, all this AI, you know, killer AI, you know, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors in terms of like the dangers that they're decrying. So, but why? Why now and why? Why is it getting so much attention? The question of our age going forward is going to be whether these machine learning systems replace human capabilities, replace human creativity. We are only just now getting a sense of what they're capable of. And so these are places where society needs to get together and have a conversation. What do we need these intelligent machines to do for us? What do we prefer to do for ourselves? And where do we place value? And in all this, I keep coming back to the idea of dysphoria, which suddenly we, you know, we hear so much about in relation to things like gender dysphoria, body dysphoria, all the debates on what is causing all that. And beyond that, just even general unease and anxiety, I think, felt by more and more people all the time as they're re realizing that the world is not skipping along the way they perhaps imagined that it does um, with, <laughs> with all the crazy stuff going down. But um, it's really interesting, too, because I came across this interview from a few weeks ago where this longtime feminist is talking about the transgender phenomenon and connecting it to Rothblatt. Um, and transhumanism, which I did a video on a little while back, and makes some very interesting connections. Well, in the 1940s, this guy, this guy William Sims Bainbridge, was uh, born. He graduated Harvard as a sociology um, professor. He's written many, many, many books um, about uh, cults, religions, technology, gaming, uh, the future of uh, psychological mind control. Um, and he now works at the head of the National Science Foundation Cyber Human uh, Program, which is the melding, uh, it's basically overlooks the ethics involved in uh, human cyber uh, melding. And you know, you can see this, this trajectory in the, uh, you know, along late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, there was a big shift in the culture from, you know, uh, data uh, from uh, the digital age and the information age um, and it's sort of uh, moved into um, artificial intelligence, transhumanism, uh, robots, nanotechnology, biotechnology, etc. So this is kind of where we're going now. This is like the future trajectory of this. But you know, Silicon Valley has been pushing a transhumanist agenda for you know, since the early 2000s, late 1990s. So then Bainbridge uh, meets up with um, another interesting character, uh, Martin Rothblatt, who is um, also a transhumanist. And Rothblatt is, um, he's a transsexual, he's a man that's appropriated uh, simulacrums of women's biology <clears throat> for himself, and he calls himself, you know, a transgender or a transsexual. And he's traveled around um, broadly in the culture in many different circles because he's accomplished so many different things. He's very well renowned and very well, you know, appreciated for his accomplishments. So he's been in the tech sector, he's been in the, um, in the medical sector, he's been in all over Hollywood, you know, he's been on Oprah and he's been on a million different shows, you know, with his robot wife, which he created. Rothblatt wrote a book and it's really like, it's really a blueprint of what's going on in the culture now. This is his ideology, um, working off of the work of Bainbridge. Um, whereas we're going to disintegrate the sexes, the boundary between the sexes. Um, there'll be no youth and age. There'll be no, you know, male and female. There'll be no, uh, transhumanism is like boundarylessness. You know, you're out there in cyberspace, ultimately. While you're getting there, it's an upgrade in humanity, melding yourself with machines, you know, uh, transferring reproduction, human reproduction to the tech sector. 
in, uh, I think it was late 1980, he got together with a whole bunch of other transvestite lawyers and, um, and transsexuals, and they created a document, which was the first, the very first gender bill, which brings disembodiment into the law. The sexual objectification of female biology, you know, into parts, and making a human right out of that. So right? what do you mean disembodiment? Well, where he's going is full-on disembodiment, where everybody lives in cyberspace. We live in a virtual reality. We don't live in our bodies anymore. We're going to be up uploaded into cyberspace. Well, in order to sell that to the public, you know, transhumanism and disembodiment as a life, um, you're going to have to groom them and get them there. And the way to do that is to um, create this ideology that says that you can choose your sex. That's disembodiment. You can't choose your sex. You are the body that you were born as, no matter what happens to you. I mean, in 200 years, if they dig up my bones, you know, they're going to find a female, you know. You can't change that. So the ideology is promoting the idea that you can, right? So, and they're driving this ideology into children's schools, not only their schools. They're driving it into their entertainment, um, their social media platforms, their schools, um, all the organizations that, you know, that cater to children are all jumping on board with, with this ideology. And this has only happened in the past 10 years. I mean, before this, we didn't hear about this word. We didn't hear transgenderism. We didn't even hear transsexual. 2014, Laverne Cox was on the cover of Time magazine, uh, owned by Mark Benioff. And, um, you know, it, it announced a transgender tipping point when there was really nothing preceding that to warrant that that would be a tipping point, 2014. It was just like dropped fully formed into the culture. And then from then on, it was just like a chant over and over and over and over and over again. You heard transgender, transgender rights, transgender rights are human rights, trans rights are human rights. These huge NGOs, these um, very huge, powerful, uh, non-governmental organizations serving the LGB community worked hand in hand with international law firms like Hogan Lovell and Denton's and Reuters Next Law and Open Society Foundation lawyers um, to create, to start to create legal guides for transgender children. So they're being, they're, they start to build this edifice of transgender children to drive this narrative you know, that you can be born in the wrong body. And so we heard all these, you know, initial stories about these poor children born in the wrong bodies, right? Which is now, you know, a decade later has morphed into just express yourself, right? You can be male, you can be female, you can be non-binary, you can, you know, have both your genitalia. And this is all about self-expression now. So it's really morphed in the course of 10 years into the right to augment yourself in whatever way you see fit. Okay, so disembodiment. She kind of hit the nail on the head there in so many ways. And that's a fascinating interview if you haven't seen it. She traces how all this stuff has been working through academia and just kind of taken over. And if you follow the money, you can trace all this back to, indeed, transhumanism. And speaking of which, um, so while I've been working on this and I was kind of reminiscing on, you know, the, the first couple of videos that I ever made were, uh, they were barely even videos, more like slideshows <laughs> with Windows Movie Maker. But yeah, just playing with the idea of AI in, in movies and propaganda and it, it's basically been around our entire lives and so it is a pretty surreal place to be <laughs> seeing all this stuff suddenly now manifesting after having been talked about for years and years and years going all the way back to, you know, the 40s and 50s, and even before that, the, the automatons of the 1800s, the, all the various forms of even robot uh, statues and things that existed in the ancient world. Something I've been <laughs> pretty focused on for seven or eight years now. Um, and in another one of those early videos I made was about clips of Carl Teichrib talking about transformational festivals and Burning Man and stuff. And I went and uh, listened to a, a podcast interview he did just like three weeks ago on this Fuzzy Creatures podcast. 
and uh, it was it was pretty cool too. I hadn't listened to him in a while, but he was pretty um, you know influential on, on my thinking in that that time around 2015 when I started listening to his research and material. And it, for those of you who don't know and haven't listened to Tyke Rib, I totally recommend it. I'm gonna play like 20 minutes worth of clips from this this podcast if that's okay hopefully they don't mind and maybe you guys will go check it out and uh, they've had on some other guests like gary wayne and some some really uh, cool people but ty crib was kind of the one who helped me start to really understand the religious uh aspect of globalism and scientism and everything and it wasn't just something that these you know elites and the secret societies and the illuminati are all you know doing behind closed doors or whatever but it really is this one world religion that is being systematically propagated throughout the world through all these uh, various ways and means which he has spent many years you know going to un environmental program you know meetings and uh, burning man and paganism festivals and all kinds of things he's he's kind of a boots on the ground researcher like par excellence so this is kind of an encapsulated version but hopefully you can see how i think what he's talking about even now completely ties into all all this stuff with ai and how it's it really is about transforming us as a species or what have you but really we're talking about mysticism the religion of oneness one ism where all you know where god nature and men are all the same thing so I'm going to play that, and then I got some other uh, super cuts and such uh, to hopefully cap it off. And also, the, the audio quality is a little sketchy in, in a couple spots, but I think it works with the lo-fi vibe today, so here we go. I'm going to read you a section of text I have it in my book, Game of Gods. This is the closing remarks from the United Nations Secretary General, Boutros Boutros Ghali, at the Rio Earth Summit. Now, for those of you who may not know, the 1990 Rio Earth Summit was the environmental conference that put in place global governance alongside of environmental issues. So it gave us Agenda 21, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Convention on Climate Change, the whole climate change narrative has so much of its roots grounded in the 1992 Rio Earth Summit. It was a really political summit, massively political. You had a scores of heads of state. I can't remember how many, I think 172, if my memory serves me correct. 17,000 or so NGO participants. This is government. And yet, as the conference opened, they had a ship named Gaia, a Viking ship that sailed from Europe to Rio de Janeiro, dock in the harbor, and, and the entire event had a very pagan-esque feel to it. So at the end of the Rio Summit, with all these heads of states, again, it's all politics, right? Boutros Boutros says this, I should like to conclude by saying that the spirit of Rio must create a new form of good citizenship. After loving his neighbor as the Bible required him to, post-Rio man must also love the world, including the flowers, birds, and trees, every part of that natural environment that we are constantly destroying. Over and above the moral contract with God, over and above the social contract concluded with men, we must now conclude an ethical and political contract with nature, with this earth to which we owe our very existence and to which gives us life. To the ancients, the Nile was a god to be venerated, as was the Rhine, an infinite source of European myths, or the Amazonian forest, the mother of forest. Throughout the world, nature was the abode of the divinities that gave the forest, the desert, or the mountains of personality which commanded worship and respect. The earth had a soul. To find that soul again, to give it new life, that is the essence of Rio. I'm sorry, gentlemen, that is flat out pagan mm -hmm. in a big P, capital P, sense of, that, of, of the word, married into a political ideology. And so before anything can really become mainstream, there already needs to be a current that's observable it, within intellectual, uh, academic elite circles and, and that was already visible going back golly to oh the late 1960s early 1970s the very first earth day that took place happened in uh, april 22nd 1970 and something to the effect of 20 million american citizens mostly mostly school children participated in that first day or first earth day and then they published a, a handbook. I've got it on the shelf over there. I should have grabbed it. And the, the environmental handbook was given to school children and classes literally 
across Canada and the United States. And it opens up with this claim that what we need is a new religion and we need to get rid of the Judeo-Christian religion mm. because it doesn't do anything in terms of its service to nature. Yes, and so allow me just to pop a couple of quotes out because now all of a sudden, I mean, to, to the point of the shift, this is, where does it begin? Well, you mm. can lay the roots beyond this, obviously, but here is where things get really interesting because it's within our time frame, okay? I mean, I was born in 68. I was just a little shyster back then, but <laughs> golly. <laughs> you know, it, it, it shaped the generation before us, right? Yeah. So it goes on to say, uh, no new set of basic values has been accepted in our society to displace those of Christianity. Hence, we shall continue to have a worsening ecologic crisis until we reject the Christian axiom that nature has no reason for existence, save to serve man. It goes on to say a little bit before that, what we do about ecology depends on our ideas of the man-nature relationship. More science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecologic crisis until we find a new re religion or rethink our old one. And it talks a lot about re replacing Christianity with, with something else. And so at the end of the handbook, uh, and I'm just going to skip through the list because the list is long, long, long. But at the end of the handbook, it gives alternatives to Christianity. And these are our social good worldviews that we need to consider as we have rejected the old norms. It seems evident that there are throughout the world certain social and religious forces which have worked mm. through history towards an ecologically and culturally enlightened state of affairs. Let these be encouraged. Gnostics, hip Marxists, Tehar Desjardins Catholics, Jewets, Taoists, biologists. I'm not sure why biologists are there, but whatever. <laughs> it goes on. Quakers, Sufis, Tibetans, Zens, Shamans, Bushmen, American Indians, and it goes on and on and on. The list is long. Yeah, I get it. The list is long. All primitive cultures, all communal and ashram movements, since it doesn't seem practical, even desirable, to think that direct bloody force will achieve much. It'd be best to consider this a continuing revolution of consciousness which will be won not by guns, but by seizing the key images, myths, archetypes, eschatologies, and ecstasies, so that life won't seem worth living unless one's on the transforming energy side. 1970. Over and over again, you hear the messaging that we're about to save the world, that what we are engaging in is the salvation of the earth. And there's a messianic complex. Mm. There is a sense that man is the one who guides our destiny. Man is the one who is in charge. We are gods now, and we, can, and we can't be capricious. That's what Marie Strong wrote in one of his books. And so there is this, this religious component to globalization, even within the po political side, because it's basically making a, an alternative messianic claim, an alternative salvation claim through our unity, politically. We save the world. In fact, we have our own priesthood. We have our academic, political priesthood. We have our own eschatology. If we don't fix the world, it will burn. Mm. We have mm. our holy writ, things like Agenda 21. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's a religion. And not only is it a religion, it's a cult because they proselytize in the hopes that they can win you over to their ideology. Right. So we have global citizenship education in the public school. You see examples of this roll through with television and, and, and movies. You can't run away from the narrative. It's in your face. When it comes to true environmentalism, we take it from the, from the approach of that, especially as Christians, that we are to be stewards. Correct. Stewards mean that we have management over something. It doesn't mean that we abuse it or destroy it. We recognize the value of it because of the one who created it. Mm. And so we're the true environmentalists. However, and this is where things get interesting, after the 1970 Earth Day, the charge had been laid at the feet of Christians and at the feet of the church specifically, that you have caused harm to the environment. In fact, your worldview is the reason why mm. We have environmental degradation. So how did the Christian church respond? We didn't respond by challenging the assumptions. We didn't. Hmm. We didn't challenge the assumptions. And that's to our shame. So we didn't challenge the assumption. And then we accepted the charge against us. And then we adopted the world's view of how to fix it. Shame on us. Hmm. Because it wasn't really ever about saving the environment. It was about bringing us in line, really more along the lines with a, with a, a spiritual ideology, a, a pagan perspective. That's really what this boils down to uh, when you see uh, how this worldview comes into play. So we should be environmentalists in the true sense of the word, not 
serving the creation, but serving our God who is the creator of mm -hmm. nature. But we, we've slipped into a Romans 1 mindset, even within the church. Now, now to the issue at hand about you know, do these people care? <laughs> do the global elites care uh, if, if they're flying to Davos in their private jets? No, 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 no. But even to think that they might, you're, you're missing them the point. And I think the famous uh, humanist from the last century, Bertrand Russell in his book, The Impact of Science on Society, makes a really important point. I'm going to read a, a, a quote from you. I've got it on my screen in front of me here. Uh, this is what he says, and, and he can pull a lot of things out of this quote. I do not pretend that birth control is the only way in which population can be kept from increasing. There are others. War, as I remarked a moment ago, has hitherto been disappointing in this respect. But perhaps bacteriological war may prove more effective. If a black death could be spread throughout the world, once in every generation, survivors could procreate freely without making the world too full. There would be nothing in this to offend the conscience of the devout or to restrain the ambitions of nationalists. The state of affairs might be somewhat unpleasant, but what of that? Really high-minded people are indifferent to happiness, especially other people's. A scientific world society cannot be stable unless there is a world government. I, I see this playing out as bookends. Really, I do believe that the end will turn around and look like the beginning, specifically in the sense that it, it builds itself out of that lie, out of the out of the out of the idea that we are as gods. It has to. It has to come full circle. That there has to be a, a return to this idea that we will that we will transgress and we will become godlike. We will maybe now do this, not just as an individual, let's say through if I, if I was an esoteric philosopher, through ritual and through the application of magic and the pressing of my will. But now instead we do this collectively. And somehow, mm. somewhere, somebody has to lead us collectively. Mm. Because otherwise we're just going to go our, our divergent ways. And we're going to have to have some type of crisis, I am convinced of that, of a magnitude far, far greater than corona, yeah. you know, to bring that into, into fruition. I'm holding here in my hand a little document I picked up when I was, uh, this is 23 years ago, boy. Uh, I was a delegate at the United Nations Millennium Forum. Um, I had, a, lack of a better way of saying it, I had embedded myself with the World Federalist uh, Association, which is the largest pro-world government lobby group in the U.S. And, and that was my job for a couple of years to kind of monitor what was happening. And so, yeah, I ended up at the United Nations Millennium Forum as, as a delegate and picked up this little document. It's not a UN document, but it, there's not many of these in circulation. And it was being given to all of us who were in attendance. And so in this little document entitled, oh, perfect, uh, perfect title, Transformation of the World, you got Jeez. little images in here like a, a world king metering out justice and power. A world king who, who, who's now on a pedestal. And the pedestal is called the Constitution, as it refers to the idea of a global constitution. And he is metering out the 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 power between the people and all the different players on the planet so the, the person who, who wrote this i'm going to butcher his name uh your your mahara it's horrible <laughs> your mente sultan mirat who was the head of the world assembly of turkic peoples mm. and was right next in line to the president of uh, kazakhstan which by the way kazakhstan and astana the capital city itself you guys know about that crazy crazy city that just screams global unity. Lots of uh, world interfaith conferences take place and other conferences on world unity and world oneness happen in Astana. So in this document, it goes on to say, small doubt that the world does need a civilized coordinator in international relations and in settling global problems. More than that, this coordinator must be a stabilizing factor. Actually, the last ditch authority on the earth, he must win confidence of each man and each nation. People must be stark sure that this coordinator would solve any problem in a just and humane way. And one should be sure that in him, he would find understanding and sympathy, that he would treat any nation as his own son, and that he is indeed the last resort. 
and the man should convince his terrestrial brothers therein by his practical deeds. Then he goes on, can the world community do without a coordinator? Definitely it cannot. So this conference was called the Global Citizenship 2000 Youth Congress, held 1,000 days before the year 2000. The organizers who put it together were theosophists, came at it from a theosophical point of view. Robert Mueller himself came at it from a theosophical uh, point of view. And so there was a lot of talk about how what we're doing is is awakening mother, making, awakening Gaia, serving the mother, serving Mother Earth, that type of thing. And he he told all the school children, because these were children who were involved at this conference. It wasn't just educators, but I think there's like eight or ten different schools that were participating. Uh, that those who were in attendance, you were all really children of the cosmos. You're all divine. Mm. Uh, you're not children of Canada. You are divine. And, and over and over again, we were told that what we were doing is we were working uh, to save, his words, to save Mother Earth. That's what being a good global citizen is all about. You're engaged in this salvation plan. Mm. And he saw it in, 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 from that spiritual point of view, and it wasn't hidden. At the end of the event, we had Ganesha, the Hindu deity who removes the obstacles with his many arms. Uh, we had a, a theatrical performance of Ganesha coming before these school children, telling all the children, the educators, the, the curriculum writers that were there, that look, just call upon Ganesha. And, and Ganesha will remove any obstacle from your mind because Ganesha is none other, none other than you. And, and it was just discuss, described to us as we were birthing the planet of God. I mean, we we're living out Robert Mueller's dream from his book, New Genesis, and where he describes this as we are becoming the planet of God. And in all of this, I ended up sitting beside a group of university students who had become future educators. And one of the, one of the university students saw through it for what it was. He didn't see through it critically. He saw it through it to accept it. He, he said, what we do, need to do, and this, these were his words, make this a virus, no inoculation, infect everyone. You see, that's the real virus. It's the heart-mind virus of Genesis chapter 3. So here we go. This is from their, uh, from, from this workshop. A non-binary look at source itself, animism and fae. Exploring spirit in a state of wholeness before conceptualization of binary perspective. Being non-binary, I've explored gender with gods, spirits, fays, shining ones, asking why they need gender. Fairy creation, and fairy, by the way, is a subset within the Wiccan community. Fairy creation started through an orgasmic exaltation, ex exaltation of God herself. We will explore these and more, delving into the alchemical union of polarities into a state of wholeness, oneness, humanity, finding our power as we reweave ourselves back into the reflection of God herself as a divine adronogen. Wow. What was interesting with this fellow's non-binary conversation was asking the question, why? Why do gods and goddesses and why do these spirits need gender? Asking this question, why they need gender? And so he broke it down this way. He said, look, as our modern culture accepts gender fluidity within us humans, this non-binary direction that we're going, where we can change back and forth and change into all kinds of other things. And this, by the way, is part of our evolutionary process. The next evolutionary stage, and this is how he framed it, the next evolutionary stage is when we begin to blur those boundaries between the physical, the human, and the spiritual with the gods and the goddesses. Mm. And so from mm. his perspective, the transgender issue was really a spiritual issue. It was a front runner, a forerunner to the next transitioning, to the next non-binary. And the next non-binary, from his perspective, was, would be this phasing between humanity and the spiritual. Mm. I thought that was a really fascinating, fascinating perspective. When it comes to Genesis chapter 6, it's, it's interesting how even the pagan community is, is presently wrestling with Genesis chapter 6. And, and I've been to workshops at, at these pagan events where Genesis chapter 6 is being discussed. Interesting. So th there, is, there is some type of commonality in terms of you know, asking the question, what happened and, mm. and and how does this play out in terms of today's 
new spirituality. Well, if everything is one, if, if, we, if oneness is truly the worldview, the most dominant worldview, and I believe it actually is the dominant worldview, I believe it's a dominant shaping force right now, uh, you know, stripping all of the, of the trappings of it away, this idea that man, God, and nature are all essentially the same. If that is true, and I put quotation marks around that, then we can transition, we can move from gender to gender, from sexuality to sexuality. We should be able to do this fluidly. We should be able to move from human to machine, from human mm. to spirit, from, from maybe human to machine, and then into spirit. It should all end up becoming fluid. And, and guess what? That's, that's how it all of a sudden is being mm. portrayed to us, whether it's true or not. And I don't think it is true. But the point being, they believe it is, and they push that narrative. It's the opposite of what the Bible is saying. So when we examine what happens, let's say, within the transhumanist worldview, or we have, you know, examine paganism, or any of these other movements and isms, we don't look to see what they're saying as being definitive, that this is the end goal that they want to achieve, and that, and that they will necessarily achieve that goal. They may achieve parts and, you know, and pieces of that goal, but we know how the end of, you know, we, don't, we, we know the end of the book. We know how it's written. We know mm -hmm. how that plays out. How far will they succeed and what kind of devastation unfolds as they push the agenda? I'm more concerned about that and how it will shape and change and challenge my neighbors, my friends, my family, and how we, how we as Christians now are, need to respond, not, not react, but respond with truth. In early 2021, we began training a StyleGAN2 model on a custom data set of around 4,000 examples of psychedelic artwork that I personally scoured from across the internet by tracking down every possible visionary artist that I could and meticulously curating any artwork that they had created. For the longest time, it was just sort of outputting pretty neat looking psychedelic patterns like the ones you can see here, but it wasn't really where we wanted it to be. So we kept fiddling around with the model, expanding the data set and training it over time, but it didn't really seem to be going anywhere. Eventually, however, the model must have had some sort of breakthrough as it suddenly started outputting not just greatly improved psychedelic geometry, but also these psychedelic faces that you can see here with about one in every 30 outputs being a psychedelic face and the rest just being abstract psychedelic geometry. The entity faces definitely looked interesting as is, but once we wrote a few lines of code to start applying symmetry to these faces, they suddenly became mind-blowingly accurate with images that very closely resemble high-level hallucinatory entities experienced under the influence of substances such as DMT or ayahuasca, probably more accurately than any other medium or creative project out there. This is just the first generation of the project, and in the future I think this neural network is only going to improve as we train it further. During the creation of this model, StyleGAN 3 was released, and we haven't even begun to train that on our dataset yet. The goal of creating artificial intelligence was for them to become gods, to create a collective mind, a global computer that sees all, sees everything, to, to create an all-seeing eye. That's what it, really what AI means. It's not like a robot running around. The robots would simply be, they'd be like a finger of, of the AI. I mean, its eyes and ears would be everywhere, every device that's network accessible. What has gone from the drawing board to the reality is this the use of neural interfacing and physiological interfacing through the idea of remote controlled small scale systems to create a nano swarm of biopenetrable materials that you cannot see that can penetrate all but the most robust biochemical filters that are able to integrate themselves through a variety of membranes mucous membranes in wherever mouth nose ears eyes and they can be done in such a level that their presence is almost impossible to detect and as such, the attribution becomes exceedingly difficult to demonstrate. The idea here is to read and write into the brain function in real time, remotely. What this has now done is put the brain literally at our fingertips. 
at our fingertips of investigation, parting the proverbial curtains of the vagaries of what the structures and functions of the brain may do, but also parting those curtains of capability to allow us to literally go in up to the elbows to be able to assess, affect, manipulate, and control the brain. It's able to speak to and decode the neurotransmitters in your brain, and that's how they're able to turn the brain of the mind control victim into their, you know, their very own visual, verbal, and auditive communication system. It takes time. They have to build a cognitive model. Uh, for, for, the, for the purposes of being able to do that, but that's how, the tech, that's how the technology is designed to operate. Rather than hardware and software, they're actually going to a new form of software, and that is the biological replacement of the human brain functioning as a quantum computer, biologically, and then loading people, integrating people into this new form of brain. There will be a virtual version of your brain as far as data is concerned of what molecules, what chemicals, and whatever make up the actual physical brain, that data could be stored in the computer. And that model would have the same input-output behavior as the original. So, if you talk to it, it might talk back. If you ask it to do things, it might do them. And if we could do that, everything would change. If our brains are connected to the internet, and if our brains are all connected, all of us connected, I could literally go into your head and see through your eyes. So all of a sudden, like for a day, like, you know, a lot of us, because you're entrepreneurs, think it would be cool to go inside Elon Musk's head for a day and walk around. Well, Elon Musk may, out, may allow people to, to get that feed and literally live through what he sees. Now, while this is what you would look like in virtual reality, this is what an M would look like when virtual reality. It's computer hardware sitting in a server rack somewhere. But still, it could see and experience the same thing. As a result of being programmed in virtual reality, the agents had the ability to take over the simulated body of any human that was a part of the matrix, converting it into a copy of their own. If that body was killed, or an agent needed to change its location quickly, it would simply take on the shell of another human that was hardwired to the matrix in a matter of seconds. The world outside of us is very big. This room, say, is much bigger than my head. But somehow, in some real sense, I have the room inside my head. And it's not just the room, it's the city. And it's not just the city, it's the country. It's not just the country, I can think of the whole planet. In fact, I can think on the scale of solar systems or maybe even galaxies. And all that, all that stuff, not just at one instant of time, but maybe over a period of decades, I can think about. So Google was set up 18, 19 years ago to build a giant artificial supercomputer based on the neuron activities of the hive mind of humanity with billions of people wired into it with the oh, internet of shit. things. And so all of our thoughts go into it. And everything you think, everything, from your feeling of self, to the feeling that you may have a soul or a, or a maker, to your preference for cilantro or not, all of those things live inside a place which is dark and small and never sees the outside world. This was a white paper put out by Purdue University in 2006 and the sentient world simulation SWS went live in 2007 which represents every person on the planet within this computer matrix as a node and every node is given an avatar an identifier and that is real time 24 7 monitoring of every person on the planet this is primarily but not exclusively facilitated by the adiabatic quantum computers produced by d-wave corporation so just like if i have a building and there's like a blueprint or a scale model of the building imagine i have the whole world and all of its concepts and I shrink it down into this weird compressed representation so that it fits inside my brain. The adiabatic quantum computer is linked to seven billion human brains. It is now, in its own language of cryptology, able to function independent of any oversight throughout the world with its own form of communication, its own form of code. And it is able to link everyone on the planet at this point. And what we are trying to do is to use this precious knowledge to build machines that can actually create 
manipulate and use these parallel realities in the service of this one. We want to grab those parallel realities from this abstract space in which they live and crunch them down into this chip. And you start thinking about us being the qubits in some massive giant quantum computing simulation. It's almost as if they're either trying to harness or to recreate what is commonly referred to as a collective consciousness. It's an engineered thing which has become a nexus point for all of these parallel realities. The shadows of all of these different universes intersect at a physical point inside of one of those boxes. You can think of it as a portal to all of these other alternate possibilities that we're trying to use in order to compute the answers to the problems we will solve. If in fact the uh, algorithms that are now believed to underpin certain aspects of cognition uh, can be run on a quantum computer, the kinds of life or kinds of species that you'll get from that will be qualitatively better. What you might get is a sentience which is fundamentally different and better. In the sense that they'll learn things faster, they'll have deeper insights, they'll be able to predict future into the future uh, farther, they'll be able to take actions that have um, uh, access to understanding that we don't. That's in a sense what I'm talking about, is that if you could build an intelligence that had a deeper ability to uh, speculate about the outcome of its actions, you might be able to get something that was qualitatively smarter. You might say if you wanted to, it's hard to define intelligence, but qualitatively better to predict the future uh, more, more effectively than, a, than any human biological brain could do. M's are very much like humans, but they are not like the typical human. The typical M is a copy of the few hundred most productive humans. It's gonna be, it's gonna be that elite class. Right, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call it, this has been the race. You know, this has kind of been what they've been trying to do in the apotheosis, in the you know the godhood that they sought. You know, so all those uh, you know fairy tales and mythologies about living forever, the fountain of youth, and things like that. This is sort of their technological answer to all that. Having the spiritual dimension be virtually created, <laughs> really around us warning 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 the miracle moment by moment of naked existence how do we soar across the landscape that has been made manifest by digital technology virtual metaverses how do we boot up this new semiotic universe? The possibilities inherent in every moment to take control of your mind stream, to go from filmmaker to trip maker, is to finally inhabit one's own mythic life. How do we enter these flow states? And if you could time lapse human progress, it would look like our minds, our consciousnesses, the imagination is spilling out of us and we are actualizing the human imagination. How do we enter these reveries? The virginal noticing of the sensate world, to recontextualize the self. How do we dance like no one's watching? We, we are literally a thinking stratum of the earth that is willing itself into existence, but that's already what biology is. So it's biology becoming aware of itself, which is also a psychedelic insight. How do we cast starlight upon ourselves and move into the light? One becomes the, the music maker and the dreamer of dreams of one's own experience. Biotechnological mRNA vaccines and eventually nanotechnology creating buildings that self-assemble. We are living in a magical world. How do we wake ourselves up? We are designing the world and ourselves into being, right? Bell bows down. Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the beasts and on the cattle. Your carriages were heavily loaded, a burden to the weary beast. They stoop. They bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but have themselves gone into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob and all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been upheld by me from birth, who have been carried from the womb. 
even to your old age, I am he. And even to grey hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. Even I will carry and will deliver you. To whom will you liken me, and make me equal, and compare me that we should be alike? They lavish gold out of the bag, and weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith, and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves, yes, they worship. They bear it on the shoulder, they carry it, and set it in its place, and it stands. From its place it shall not move. Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer, nor save him out of his trouble. Remember this, and show yourselves men. Recall to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man who executes my counsel from a far country. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Listen to me, you stubborn heart, who are far from righteousness. I bring my righteousness near. It shall not be far off. My salvation shall not linger. And I will place salvation in Zion, for Israel my glory.